So thanks a lot for inviting me to talk here again. It's a great pleasure to talk about detecting primes in multiplicatively structured sequences. So this is joint work with Yuri Merikoski and Dioni Teravainen. Okay. So I will start with a sort of a gentle introduction to sieves and uh, detecting primes by sieves. And then I will go on to talk about our recent work. But I will just start with the introduction to sieve problems. So the basic question with the, in the sieve problem is that they have some sequence A of natural numbers. And we want to know if there are primes in A or if there are many primes in A. And uh, of course, we can take the set A to be anything and then ask this question. And I have some examples here. So if we take A to be the set of integers up to x, such that n plus 2 is a prime, then we are asking if there are twin primes. If there are n such that n plus 2 are both prime, so this is asking about twin primes. And uh, the second example, we can take a co-prime integers a and q, and we can take a to be the set of integers up to x, such that n is a mod q. And then we can ask if there are primes that are a mod q. So it's a uh, old and famous theorem of Dirichlet, that there are indeed infinitely many primes p, which are a mod q. But if we take x to be not too big compared to q, then the problem becomes more difficult. And in particular, if we have x to be q to l for some constant l, then this is called Linnick's problem, because Linnick wasn't the first one to show that there exists a constant l, such that we actually have a prime p, which is a mod q, and which has size at most q to l for some constant l. Okay. And the third example, we could take the set A to be an interval, which is short compared to the point where the interval is on the real line. So we could look at the interval from x minus x to alpha to x, and with alpha being between 0 and 1. And then this is called primes in short intervals, if we want to detect primes in this set. And then the fourth and final example, which is a bit different from the others, we can take the set A to be the set of all integers which have an even number of prime factors. So obviously this set doesn't have any primes because the primes have exactly one prime factor. But for reasons that I will explain, so this is actually an important example of a sequence that we might want to try to see. And in general, what sieve methods can achieve, they can give us upper bounds of correct order of magnitude for quite a wide range of parameters. So for instance, here we can get a correct order of magnitude upper bound for the number of twin primes and for the number of primes in arithmetic progression and so on. I will discuss more about what is known about these examples in the next slide. Uh, and as for the lower bounds, if we use just sort of classical C methods, they can give us lower bounds for the set, which I call SHZ, which is the set of numbers in A, whose all prime factors are at most z. So I write pz for the product of all primes up to z. So if n is co-prime to pz, that means that all the prime factors of n are at, are at least z. And if I take a to be a subset of 1 to x, and then if I take z to be x to half, then all the numbers in sa z are, are primes. So this is indeed a one dysfunction. OK, so this is the basic thing that the same methods aim for. We are given some set and we want to know if there are primes. And so what's known about these examples? So for the twin primes, we have a upper bound due to prune using prune's sieve, which is of expected order of magnitude. We know that the number twin primes up to x is at most a constant times x over log squared x. And this is what we expect. And on the other hand, we do have a lower bound for almost twin primes, which is primes such as p plus 2 has at most two prime factors. So omega is the total number of prime factors. And for them, we have a lower bound of size x over log squared of x. And this is due to chain using a classical sieve plus a switching trick. Uh, as for the example 2, which was the Linux problem, so asking for the least L such that for any co prime, prime A and Q, the x is the prime p, which is a mod q, and of size at most q to l. And uh, this is known for l equaling 5, due to work of Xylouris, following and refining the work of Heat-Brown, 
who had 5.5 and the unique who saw that they exist an L and then there are lots and lots of results in between Linux and Heat Brown, basically giving different improving values of L. And uh, in order to get this, the proof of the Linux theorem, one needs to use deep information about zeros of L functions, one needs the zero free reason, one needs log free zero density results, and uh, we, one needs the sort of repulsion of the zeros. And the third example, primes in short intervals. Again, we get an upper bound of correct order of magnitude for intervals of length x to epsilon, but a lower bound for the primes we get for intervals of length x to 0 0.525 by work of Baker, Harman, and Pins. And this uses a Harman's prime detecting sieve. Okay. And for the example four, which was the numbers that have an even number of prime factors for this, we of course know a good upper and lower bound for the number of primes that are zero primes in this set. So that's of not very interesting. Okay, so I mentioned a classical sieve and what I mean by a classical sieve is a sieve like Brun's sieve or Professor Ivanyet's sieve or Beta sieve or whatever. It is something that takes type 1 information. I will sort of explain what is type 1 information for the set A as an input, and it returns as an output up and lower bounds for SHZ, which was the number of integers in A, which are called prime 2, or the, which has all prime factors at least Z. So we have a, some type 1 information for A, and then we feed it into a classical sieve, and then we get up and lower bounds for SHZ. And uh, remember that S A X to half is the prime, basically the primes in A is if A is contained in integers up to X. So this is related to the primes, and we in particular get upper bounds for the primes. And uh, type one information is information about the size of the sets A D, which is the integers n such that D times n belongs to A. So in order to have good type one information, we have to be understood the number of elements in A, which are divisible by D. And more precisely, for this type 1 information, so we write this AD for the set of N, such that DN belongs to A, and in particular, the size of AD is the number of elements in A that are divisible by D. And then we say that the set A, okay, so this is a subset of integers, up to x. I'm sorry, there's a typo. I should not have i, but I should have the integers from 1 to x. It has level of distribution theta. If we have some sort of the main term x, which is basically the size of the set a, and the multiplicative function h, such that if we look at the number of elements in a, which are divisible by d, it's about x over d times hd. So quite often in application, hd is basically 1 for D, and the number of elements in A that are divisible by D is about X over D, where X is about the size of A. And if we know for this for the D going up to X to theta, on average, then we say that we have a well distribution theta. And this is what we call type 1 information, this thing that we have some level of distribution. So we understand the distribution of A in arithmetic progressions up to X to theta. And uh, if this HP is one on average, then we have a linear sieving problem. And this can pretend more precisely in a, I mean, there's a more precise definition of what means being one on average. So it means that the, this product of one minus HP over P minus one has an upper bound, which corresponds to the upper bound that one would have if HP was one for other primes. But it's not very important. In our examples, basically it's, HD will be with just one. Okay, so this is what we need for the level distribution. We need to understand the number of elements in A divisible by D. And in our examples, in the first example, we had the twin primes. So the A is the set of X of the 10 plus 2 is a prime. And for this, if we look at now elements which are divisible by D, it means that the the prime is minus two mod d. So this is primes in arithmetic progressions on average. So Bombier Vinogrado gives us level of distribution, half minus epsilon in this case. 
And uh, in the case of our second example, the Linux type thing, we are looking at the set A, which is n sub to x, that are a mod q. And here, if x is q to l, the trivial estimate, which I will discuss in next slide, gives us the level distribution 1 minus 1 over l minus epsilon. And in the short interval case, a similar trivial estimate gives us the level distribution alpha minus epsilon for any epsilon. And in the fourth case, there we had n being the numbers that have an even number of prime factors. We actually have a level distribution 1 minus epsilon, which is the best possible basic level distribution. We get it from the prime number theorems cousin for the real Vega function. So from the fact that the sum of real Vega function up to x is the little of x, we get the level distribution 1 minus epsilon. So in this case, where we don't have any primes, we have a very good level of distribution. So this um, tells us something about the uh, restrictions that we have with the trying to detect primes with the classical C method, even if we have a... So the idea was that the C takes type 1 information, and then it gives us information about the SHZ. But even if we have very, very good type 1 information, it might be that there are no primes. So this is why this is an important example. Okay, so I promise that I will tell how to get this sort of trivial estimate for the level distribution. So in this case, we had this a being the integrals up to x that are a mod q. And I choose my function h to be the characteristic function of the numbers that are co prime to q. And I take my main term x to be x over q. Okay, and then in order to study the level distribution, I need to study the difference of AD minus HD over D times X. And plugging in the definition of A, we see that the size of AD is precisely the number of Ns up to X over D, such that N times D is A mod Q. And we had that this HD was this characteristic function of D and Q being co-prime. And then we have X over QD here. And if we look at this thing here, then if we had that d, d is has some common factor with q. Okay, so I actually I think I'm messing things up a bit. I should have here the numbers that are to go and being comfortable. Anyway, if we count the number of integers up to x over d such that m times d is a mod q, we get x to x over q over qd, usually, and with an error term of big O of 1. But then, yeah, if d is not co-prime to a q, then we don't have any solution at all, because a is co-prime to q, yeah, in our case. So in that case, we get a 0 for the sum, as we should, because we have the characteristic function here. And in case that d is co-prime to q, we can just look at numbers n up to x over d such that n is a times uh, d inverse mod q, and we get x over q d plus big O of one of them. And so we get the upper bound x to theta here. And in order to get some level of distribution theta, we needed the upper bound to be x over q times, say, log x to minus 100. And this holds if theta is at most 1 minus 1 over l in case that x is q to l. So in this case, it's quite easy to calculate the, to get a level distribution 1 minus 1 over L. And I should say that in all these three cases, it's possible to get better level of distribution than one that is stated. In particular, if one uses a bilinear form of the error term, but I just gave some indication of what sort of level of distribution we can get. Okay. So let's now return to the example four, which was the set A, the n has even number of prime factors. So it had essentially the best possible level distribution, one minus epsilon, but no primes. So we can't hope that this type one information alone detects primes, but we still get upper and lower bounds from the linear C for S, H, Z. 
but we can't just get it for if a is a subset of 1 to x, we can't take z to be x to 1 over 2. In particular, the lower bound that the linear sieve gives is non-trivial once we had z to be x to theta over 2 minus epsilon or something smaller. And the theta is always at most 1, so we can't really hope to detect primes, but we can hope to detect, say, things that are prime or a product of two primes, like in sense theorem for the twin primes. One guess that p plus 2 is infinitely often either a prime or a product of two primes. But in particular, as I said, we can't get from the linear C alone a non-trivial lower bound for the number of primes in our set A. But it turns out that this is basically the only obstacle that there exists, this example. So there's a Bombieri's asymptotic sieve. At first, I unfortunately have a bit technical formulation, but on the next slide, I will give a very clear consequence of this thing. So what Bombieri's asymptotic sieve tells us that is that if we have a linear sieving problem and we have level distribution one minus epsilon for every epsilon, then there exists delta x between 0 and 2, such that if we write dr for the set of r tuples, where the sum is 1 and everything is between 0 and 1, and we have any smooth function c from dr to r, and we want to count the number of products of exactly r primes in the set A, weighting each prime according to the to its logarithmic size compared to n. So if all of these are of size, say, n to 1 over r of similar size, then this is c of 1 over r to 1 over r, and so on. So this is some smooth function. And for any smooth function, we can calculate this to be a expected main term times something which depends only on this delta x and only on the parity of the r. So we obtain main terms times delta x if r is odd, and main terms times times 2 minus delta x if i is even. In particular, the sort of the number of products of r primes in the set A, if we have put an appropriate sort of normalization, it depends only on whether i is odd or whether i is even. So that's why we can sort of detect numbers that have either one or two prime factors, but we can't find primes. Well, because for one either delta x or two minus delta x must must be non-zero, but it might be that we have that delta x is zero and then two two minus delta x is two, and this is the case in our fourth example where we had this the set to consist of numbers that have an even number of prime factors. In that case, we have delta x being zero. We don't have anything if we are looking for numbers that have an odd prime factor, odd number of prime factors, but we have a lot of them if we are looking for numbers that have an even number of prime factors. And this is sort of a special case of Selberg's famous formula. No, a special case of this is Selberg's famous formula that he used in his elementary proof of prime number theorem, which says that if we take log x times the sum of primes up to x log b and add the corresponding sum for products of two primes will log b log q, then we get 2x log x plus an error term. So this corresponds to summing this for i equaling 1 and i equaling 2, then this delta x disappears and we get the 2 from here. Anyway, this is slightly technical, but I have a nice consequence on the following slide, which says that if we have a linear sieving problem, where the level of distribution is very good, 1 minus epsilon for every epsilon. And if we know that we have some products of three primes in the set, so this is the expected lower bound for the products of three primes. And if we know that there are the expected order of magnitude of products of three primes, then Bombier received tells us that this delta x must be positive. And then we can apply the Bombier, the same formula with the r equaling one. And so we get that there are also primes in the set A, the correct order of magnitude. So this is the expected lower bound for the number of primes. And actually, this holds the, the product of three primes replaced by the product of R primes for any fixed odd R. 
So basically, if we have this very good level of distribution, and we can find the correct order of magnitude number of products of 223 primes in our set, then we immediately get that we also have primes in the set. So this is pretty interesting. And this shows that this sort of my example four, having only numbers that have an even number of prime factors is the only example that we have. This is the only obstruction in case we have this very good level of distribution one minus epsilon. Of course, in the real life, we often have the worse level of distribution. Like for the twin primes, we only had half, and then we don't have quite similar thing happening. Okay, so know that in the fourth example, all these sets are empty. So this doesn't sort of give a contradiction with our problematic scenario. Okay, so let us return to Linux problem and see how this is helpful for the Linux problem. So recall example two, where we had A to be the set of integers up to X such that N is A mod Q and X is Q to L. And remember that the level distribution was one minus one over L minus epsilon. And so for large L, this is very close to one. So we don't have one minus epsilon for any epsilon, but we have something which is very close to one. Faisa, sorry, um, just one question from Igor Spalinski. Igor, do you want to unmute? Oh. Hi, Kaisa. Sorry, just wanted to check. Uh, you had strict inequalities in your condition. Don't if a bit r equals one? Yeah, I think you are right that this is not immediately. Oh. I mean, so it should be less, less equal. Yeah, I think you get similar thing also in the case that you just have this. I mean, you are being one and you one being one and nothing else. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yes. May I answer okay. the question? Yes. The, the R equal to one is just an axiom. That's it in delta x so it's not a condition somehow that i mean yeah so i i don't see a problem here yeah yeah, yeah. i mean delta x is just the distribution of the sequence over primes which is not subject to verification it's just simply notation no, no, but I'm asking about you. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, so the the, uh, the, the this is the, the second the line is just assumption, right? For r equal to or from take r less than equal larger than equal to two. Yeah. But for r equal to one, it's not an assumption. Essentially, it's 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 involved in delta x. I mean, it has to be phrased differently, uh, right? But anyway. I don't see a problem here. Yeah, yeah, there is no problem, but it could have been written out better. Yeah, I agree. Just oh, yeah. wanted to write it down <laughs> in a short, short way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for the question. So back to the Linux problem. So we had level distribution one minus one over L, which is close to one if L is large. And we also have a recent theorem by myself and Yoni Teravainen, where we proved that if we take A and Q to be co-prime, then there exist three primes, P1, P2, P3, that have size at most Q to one plus epsilon, such that P1 times P2 times P3 is A mod Q. And then Q is Q3, we can take epsilon to be zero. And uh, well, let me just say a few words about the proof. It's not important here except that we are using some of the same methods later. But in this proof, we introduced the so-called multiplicative transference principle, and we used popular Knesset theorem and studied subgroups of ZQ star, this small index. So we used some sort of additive combinatorial tools to prove this. And uh, But the point is that this theorem here shows that this set A has some products of three primes. And uh, earlier I said that if we have a 
very good level of distribution and we have products of three primes so then we can find primes too. So a natural question to ask is, is if this combination of these two things could give us a new L-function free proof of Linux theorem. Because now we have this Bombieri type thing, which tells us that it suffices to find products of three primes. And we have this theorem, which tells us that there are products of three primes. Uh, there are some issues, like in Bombieri's theorem, we want the level distribution to be one minus epsilon for every epsilon. And also that if there are exceptional characters, then the lower bound for the products of three primes is necessarily small as there are few primes that are in mod Q for certain A's and Q's. Okay. And uh, so this is the question. Can we get a new L function free, free, free proof of Linux theorem? And uh, the answer is yes, we can. So together with Yori, Merikoska, and Yoni Deravan, we are showing that the X is the prime P of size at most Q to L, so that P is A mod Q. And so this is a new L function free proof. So the only thing we need about L functions is that L1 chi is at least of size Q to minus half. Actually, if we were happy to increase the value of L, it would suffice to have any polynomial lower bound for the L1 chi, but we can just use this classical bound we don't need the q to minus epsilon bound here. And at the moment, we have L equaling 350, but this might still change. If you heard me talking about this in July, I think this has changed, but for the better, this exponent. And uh, we are still checking some details, so it might, might be that it's changes a little bit, either to the better or to the worse. But uh, definitely we have not optimized the exponent. We are aiming for simplicity rather than optimality. So we know several ways how we could make this exponent better, but it will al always complicate the proof of it. And we want to make it simple, as simple as possible, basically. And uh, this could be compared with some previous results like Friedland and Ivanitz and Opera de Cripro, they also give an almost L-function free proof of Linux theorem. And then in the recent papers, they calculated the constant and they resulted so that they get L being 75 million, 70, 744,000, which is quite a bit bigger than 350. And also, it was not quite L function free. They used the zero free region for the L function. So they avoided the zero density and the zero repulsion, but they still use it the zero free region. And uh, we don't use it. And they also use a low one for L1 chi. So this is something that everybody needs to use. And there is also a relatively recent L function free proof of Cranville, Harper, and Sounder and Sound. And uh, well, they did not calculate the L, but uh, according to them and some other people, the L for their proof will be quite big as well. And uh, well, regardless, the very optimized L function full proof yields L equaling five. So this is still of different order of magnitude, but on the other hand, there are previous works be before Heat Brown where uh, one still used quite deep things about L functions and got something bigger than this 350. So there's something, I mean, depending on what you compare to is how happy you are. If you compare with this 75 million, then it makes you happy. But if you compare with, with this file, then it doesn't make you too happy. Anyway, this is what we, what we get from this process. Okay, so let me explain how we actually sort of implement this strategy. So let us take A to be the familiar set of n's up to x that are a mod q. And we have the level distribution d to be x to 1 minus 1 over l minus epsilon. And then we want to find primes in the set A. So we study the set S A square root of x, which has the primes from A between square root of x and x. And now we use bookstop's identity as a first step. 
to notice that numbers whose all prime factors are at least square root of x are the same as the numbers whose all prime factors are at least d to half, except that we have to subtract numbers who have a prime factor between d to half and x to half. And having guess a, b, b here uh, con make sure that we take every number only once away. Okay. And now, as I told previously, we can use linear sieve to get upper and lower bound for this. So we can use linear sieve to get the lower bound for this and, up and the upper bound for this. And uh, the only problem really is that the lower bound we get from the linear sieve is basically negative. And so for the first term, we can use the linear sieve to get the lower bound, which looks like this. There is a function f2 from the linear sieve, and then there is the expected main term. But, and uh, the sad thing is that this f2 is 0. So this first line is what one gets if one applies the linear sieve in the traditional way. So we get that the number of integrals in A, whose all prime factors are at least d to half, is at least 0. And this is not very helpful because uh, I mean we have a trivial lower bound of zero in any case. But the following Friedland and Ivan, yes, we actually know very clearly, very well what is what the linear sieve sort of leaves behind. What are the numbers that cause the fact that we get the lower bound f2 rather than something nicer? So we can add the things that the linear sieve did not count. I will have a much nicer formula on the next slide. Here we just have the general definition of, of including everything that we give away in this lower bound, which are products of some, so n primes times a number m, which has all prime factors at least b to n. And uh, it's worth noticing that if we had associated a, we had this set of example four numbers with even number of prime factors, then all these extra terms would be zero and we would not gain anything. But here we gain something. And we can do a similar upper bound from the linear sieve for the second term in our lower bound. And uh, for that, we get some upper bound from the linear sieve where we have a capital F and this capital F is positive. So at the first place, the lower bound we get for the number of primes is actually negative. But then we again get these extra terms. And again, they will come to the top with a positive sign. And combining these things and throwing out some positive terms, we get something which is turns out to be useful. But for technical reasons, I first point out that we will actually want to study numbers between x to half and x with logarithmic weights, so 1 over n type weights. And then using this linear sieve, taking into account what it leaves behind, we get the lower bound for the sum of 1 over p of primes between x to half and x, which I mod q. And this lower bound includes first, first a negative term, which comes from the applying the upper bound sieve for this SAP. So this first term gives zero basically for the main term, and this gives something negative. So the first term here is negative. It looks a bit ugly, but it's something that you can compute if you have some given value of L. You can just compute what is the first term. And the second term is just the part of N being two here combined with something else, some part from here, probably. But in any case, this one of the things that the linear sieve leaves behind is the products of three primes all of which have size between x to 1 over 6 and x to 1 over 3. So we get this sort of lower bound. And we write minus s2 for this first term and plus s3 for the second term. And then <coughs> our aim is to show that this s3 is less than s2. If we can do this, then we get primes in that are a mod q and have size at most x. And here, it's worth noticing that if our L, when our L gets bigger and bigger, this inner integral in the term S2 gets more and more narrow. So even so, it, it, the negative term gets very, very small when L gets large. 
And then for the second term, the L doesn't have such, it doesn't make such a huge difference. What is the size of L? It gets easier to deal with the second term when L gets larger. It doesn't sort of shrink like the first term. So this gives us some hope. We just have to get some positive lower bound of correct order of magnitude lower bound for the S3. So this is what we have reduced to proving. And if we want to get the explicit constant like L equal 350, then we of course have to calculate this first term. And then we have to get something bigger here than what we get from the negative term. But anyway, we have reduced to studying products of three primes. And now what we do here, we want to study these products of three primes using additive combinatorics. So this is the new innovation in our proof. So in the Friedland and Ivanitz, they instead go into products of five primes, which makes the lower bound they can get uh, was already. And then they use, I think, some uh, the expansion as with Dirichlet characters, and then even say they use the trio free region there for one of the primes in order to, and the sort of second moment for the two of the primes to get some something out of it to find the products of five primes. Instead, we study products of three primes and use some additive combinatorial tools to do it. So I will, to get rid of the primes and turn into sort of problem in additive combinatorics, I define CB, to be a normalized count of primes p from this interval that are b mod q, one over p. So this phi q over log two is a normalization factor. By Merton's prime number theorem, we know that the sum over primes between x to one over six and x to one over three is log two, and we expect that the proportion one over phi q of the primes is b mod q. So this is normalized so that we expect this to be about one. And now if we, in S3, we split each prime with the, into residue classes, bi. So we sum according to bi being bi mod q. We can get a lower bound for S3 in terms of this function cb. So we have this normalization factor cubed. And then we are summing over a being b1 times b2 times b3 of cb1, cb2, cb3. So this is a triple convolution of the function c. And now we know that the average value of t is one, because if we sum over all the residue classes, then this is just the sum of primes between x to one over six and x to one over three, one over p. And we know why Merton's prime number theorem that it's log two. So on average, cp <coughs> is one. And on the other hand, by the Prunditz mass, or just the basically the linear C1 algebra distribution one minus one over L. We get an upper bound, point wise upper bound for CB, which is actually two plus twice log one plus three over L minus six over log two. It's not too important what's here, but notice that when L is getting large, this, <coughs> sorry, being inside log, is getting close to one. And so this CB is quite close to two in case that there is large. Okay, so we need a lower bound for this triple convolution. And we had that this C is on average one and we have a pointwise upper bound for it. And there are two ways to proceed from here. We can either use Fourier analysis or we can use a popular Knesset theorem. And uh, either way, we can show that this holds unless there exists a quadratic character Psi, so that Psi B is not Psi A very often. Okay, so I will briefly sketch both approaches to this. So the Fourier approach turns to give us a better constant, so that's what we use at the end. So the <laughs> this is what we need. And so we have, by using the orthogonality of characters, we can write this convolution as a sum of characters of the Fourier tra transform or the 
these are the character sum of C cubed. And now the principal character contributes just phi q squared. And uh, the real characters for which chi a times c hat is positive, make a positive contribution. And for all the other characters, we can get an L infinity bound for c hat chi, unless there exists a real character such that psi, psi, psi p is different from chi a very often. So I don't go into any details, but this is just the sort of a sketch how we can do it. And to get the possible, this L infinity bound is sufficient. And on the other hand, the other way to deal with this triple convolution is via Knesset. So in this case, we don't want to dispose of the function C and instead look at sets. So we write A to be the set of Bs for which CB has size at least epsilon. And then it suffices to solve that A belongs to A times A times A popularly, basically because this triple convolution is at least epsilon cubed times the size of the set A times A times A. Or the number of representations that A has in the set A times A times A. And now from the average value of C and the upper bound, pointwise upper bound for C, we can deduce that the A has size at least one over kappa L, and this kappa L is quite close to two. And on the other hand, if we know that A times A is at least has size phi Q minus A plus epsilon phi Q, then by pigeon holding, we can see that A times A times A is actually everything. And on the other hand, we do have an up lower bound for A times A from Knesset's theorem, which is that A times A is at least twice A times H, minus size of H, where H is the stabilizer of A times A. And in particular, if the stabilizer has index larger than two, then this lower bound from Knesset is better than what we requested here. And the only case where we are in trouble is that H has index two. And also the only case where we are in trouble it turns out to be the case that A is not in H. And thinking about the Characters, this is the same thing that there exists a real character psi mod q such that psi p is not equal to psi a very often. So either way, we can get a lower bound for this triple convolution. And then we are left with the exceptional case that there does exist a real character such that very often we have that psi p is different from psi a. So the very often means like 95% of the time, for instance or something like this here, yeah. to sort of optimize the numerics. We are having a precise proportion, something like 90% or something like this. So it's not like almost always or anything like this. And it's closely related to having an exceptional zero for the corresponding L functions, but we don't have to talk about the exceptional zeros of L functions. We can just discuss whether we have this relation or not. And uh, First, we notice that it's not really possible that psi p is plus one very, very often. Uh, because, well, we can use a C method to show that there are either quite many prime species of the psi p of minus one, or quite many products of two primes such that psi of p1 times p2 is minus one. So there's a typo here, which I forgot to correct. So. We either have a lot of primes as a psi p is minus one or a lot of products of two primes as a psi p1, p2 is minus one. But in this latter case, we must have either that psi p1 is minus one or psi p2 is minus one because the product is minus one. So we can't really have that psi p equals one very often. And in the case we have that psi a equals one, we can get back to following and any one is, and we can see the sequence of one convolved with psi. And now if psi p is minus one very often, then this sieving problem is not anymore a linear sieving problem. It is a very low dimensional sieving problem. And thanks to this, we can detect primes from this sequence and we can do it precisely say in the case that we have this happening for 95% of the time, then we can get a, get a lower bound for the number of primes. So in either case, 
we can also deal with the exceptional case. And this sort of finishes the proof of the Phoenix theorem. And uh, then I want to discuss some, briefly discuss some more general things that we can do. So we can do this more generally. There is nothing very specific about the Phoenix problem. We can try a similar argument, for instance, in the case where a is the set of n such that f, fn is c for some yeah. multiplicative function f and some c from a finite group. So in case of Phoenix theorem, we had c to be a from zq star and fn to be just the reduction of n mod q. And uh, we can also, it suffices to have some more general structure. We don't have to have even this structure, but we need to be able to say something about the products of three primes. And we can probably say at least something concerning the Cebotarev analog for Linux, but this is work very much in progress. So don't ask questions about it because I don't yet know what we get there and what's, what's the final result will be. And also, Instead of finite groups, we can also get a variant for infinite groups. And this, for instance, implies that we can do primes in short intervals. So we can, there exists a delta such that if you look at primes in intervals of like x to one minus delta, there's the correct order of magnitude of them. And we have not yet calculated this delta, but we expect it to be reasonable, but not close to the record 0.525. And in any case, we again obtain a proof without utilizing zeros of the zeta function. And uh, Cranville, Hub, and Sound also had such a proof, but they did not again calculate the value of delta. But we expect to get something pretty reasonable, but I don't yet know what. And the basic idea here is also that the level distribution is one minus delta minus epsilon for any epsilon, so it suffices to find products of three primes. And uh, in order to do this, I don't go into details here. I wrote a bit too many formulas on this slide, but uh, what we want to do is we want to have this product of three primes and we can again uh, sort of define an appropriate function C, which has average value of one and which is at uh, point wise bounds two plus something. And uh, for which we have that we can get into studying a triple convolution of C. And basically the idea is that if we multiply three things from short intervals, then we end up with a thing in a short interval. So we want that the product is in the interval of length x to one minus delta. So we take our primes to be from intervals of length x to x to one over, say one over three to one over three plus x to minus delta over 100 or something like that. And then we end up with primes in the wanted interval, but I don't go into details. But in any case, we get similar problem, but now the Fourier analysis is a bit different. And also the combinatorics is a bit different because we have an infinite group instead of finite group. So instead of Knesset's theorem, we could apply sort of a popular form of Freiman's 3K minus 3 theorem here. But on the other hand, there are no problems with subgroups of index two here. So that helps a, a little bit. Okay, so finally, let me give a summary of what I have talked in now here. So we saw that if we have a sequence which has level distribution sufficiently close to one and has some multiplicative structure, and we can deal with obstructions of subgroups of index two, then we can detect primes. <laughs> and uh, how to do this is that we use exact form of linear sieve to find products of three primes. So to show that it suffices to find products of three primes. And then we use some additive combinatorial material tools to find products of three primes in the set. And in particular, we obtain a new L function free proof of Linux theorem with a reasonable constant and a new set of function free proof of Hoheisel's theorem for primes in short intervals, except that we get the lower bound rather than asymptotic formula for the number of primes. Okay, so that's it. Thank you.